Okay. Uh, Tyler Spear, who's in college, technology, for vision repair. Uh, I used to uh, come to SunTech last year. Uh, uh, at the down program, and I did South Security USA. I really liked the class. Uh, whenever I first came in, I didn't want to do, I wanted to do auto body, but I was more of the diesel mechanics. But after a couple months, I turned to being a diesel and auto body. I just like turning a wrecked car or painting something and looking at it and seeing how good of a job I did in the books. In college, isn't really that different from tech? Beside, well, here besides the uh, classes or the classes are different because it's college, but uh, everything you guys learn from um, the uh, ICAR CDs is everything that we, we use at our, in our uh, lecture classes. Um, all my tests, I've used current notes that I'm taking now and the notes that we take in our binders. So if you plan on going to college next year, definitely keep them because I've had to use them already, I'll admit it, and whenever I took the uh, non-structural class to uh, advanced place, I had to use my notes for the non-structural and for the three or four tests. I've, been to, I've taken a basic prevention class right now, that's how Thomas is Awesome, pro awesome class. We already jumped into our first project, and he's trusting us, the team that I'm on, and four, four of the people are on, with uh, mixtures of levels, uh, including on refinishing and sanding. And it's a 1939 Buick Special for uh, Swanger. Uh, yeah, it's in the Hershey Museum, Hershey Museum most of the time. Project. I have yeah, we're going to try to do that af afterwards. I thought oh, we'd try okay. to do that at the end. Um, we're, only on, we're on day seven. Today was day seven of our shop days, and we already just now got down to Nyko from completely having it just rolled up to us. We had to mask, sand, and spray the DP sealer for the prevent rust and then we did three coats yesterday or today one coat yesterday two coats today of the sealer of the primer primer, primer surface yep and we got the hood and the cargo lid guide coat sanded today and we before we left we guide coated the whole car by next Thursday, we'll be ready to sand it and apply finishing putty, whatever in place we need. Actually, the car's in really good shape, and there was no rust on the car, and we've got a couple of small things that we've got to take care of. But it was, until we started on it, it was a survivor car, which means it had never been painted before, never been touched. And the interior is absolutely perfect for a car as old as it is. So you want to turn it over to Al then? Yeah. Okay. Hi there. I'm, I'm Al Thomas. I was invited here. I'm very pleased to be here. I've been a, a, associated with your school for many years now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm at about the end of my career. And when I, I say that with a little bit of hesitation because I don't, I'm going to retire at the end of this school year, but I'm going to retire from teaching. I'm not going to retire and sit down and... <laughs> and do nothing. I have a farm but in Michigan. I'm originally from Michigan. I'm uh, um, from just outside uh, Detroit. I was born and raised 50 miles west of Detroit, so my parents sort of figured I'd have to do something with cars. You know, it's, it's inevitable from there. But because most of my family, my daughters and son and my grandchildren live back in Michigan, when I bought a farm back there, and I'm going to retire to it at the end of the school year. But I was invited here to sort of give you the, a little bit about what, how my career went and how it changed over the years because 
Um, I didn't always, it, it, although I was always interested in cars, uh, I never thought I would be a, a college professor. And, and uh, as you probably know, I'm a co-author of the book that we have here, uh, which it was a lot of work uh, and would have not um, at all believed that I've been the man writing that book because I'm still the third worst speller in the world. And I um, hated English class when I was your age. In fact, um, I did not um, graduate from high school. I got my GED uh, when I was in the military. Uh, when I went over, I'm a, a Vietnam veteran, and I went from uh, high school. I went all the way through my 12, you know, my school years, but I didn't have all the credits because I was sort of a school up in high school. And I uh, was overseas, and while everybody else was going out and uh, getting R&R &R in Australia and other really nice places, I would go down to Saigon and, and finish my high school. And I got my high school diploma uh, in Saigon, Vietnam. Uh, came back with a GI Bill, and it, the GI Bill um, provided my education all the way up to what I have now. So what I'd like to do, what I was asked to do, was talk about my career and what I do and all of those things. So I'm sort of the kind of person that likes question and answer. So if there's anything that you're interested in, about how I matured through. I'll tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about Jesse. I'm sure you're curious about Jesse. Um, I'm a, um, I, I did two, they call them deployments now. They used to be called tours of duty. I did two deployments in Vietnam uh, in combat the whole time and um, came back from Vietnam. And at that time, on August 66, 1970, post-traumatic stress disorder was not well known and did not, um, um, was not easy to diagnose and they didn't treat very well and I sort of had it from the time I got discharged till you know present day and deal, dealt with it on my own um, the VA didn't help at all and my daughter who is a physician assistant said what she about three years ago thought that I had uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD I went to the VA, and to make a long story short, they're now treating post-traumatic stress disorder with, with service dogs, and Jesse is a trained service dog to help me with that. So not all service dogs are, are, are seeing eye dogs. You know, I drove up here, so he's not a seeing eye dog. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he's very helpful with me. He's in my classroom the whole time. He gets along in the lab. The only, in fact, he likes to go in the paint booth when we're spraying, and I wish he wouldn't do that because Obvious one hair, and <coughs> excuse me, I don't want him to get contaminated from the from the. Uh, but he's uh, quite an. I think I don't think he's one of the guys. Isn't he? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's, the only thing he doesn't like is we have when the doors go up and makes a <laughs> clicking noise. He doesn't like that. He contracts the door. So what did? How did my career camp come about? I started working on cars at about 14 years old. I bought my first car when I was 14. My father didn't want me to have it at first because he thought I'd get it running and want to drive it and I had what was called a farm permit. I don't know, I don't think they have them here in Pennsylvania, but in Michigan you could get a farm permit to drive on the road when you were 14 years old in Michigan as long as you were doing farm business. So I started driving, in fact I was, me and two other farm boys would drive to driver's training which was sort of funny. But. Um, when I told him the car was only, I was only spending five bucks on it, he figured it was such a junk car, I'd never get it going. But within three months, I had it all fixed up and painted, and, and although that was my first car that I painted at 14, I painted my first professional vehicle when I got paid for on August 6, 1965. Okay? So in, in about a year and a half, that'd be 50 years that I've been painting cars. And I first did it because I had champagne taste and beer money, you know, I liked nice cars and couldn't afford them. So I'd have to buy something that was wrecked or something that was junk, and we now call it flipping cars, but I've owned over 125 cars since I was 14, some of which I've only driven for a couple of days and sold it for a profit, made profit on every car I've ever owned except for a Vega. You can laugh now if you know much about Vegas, they were a junk piece of car from the beginning. Um, but got into, uh, when our military came about, 
Um, my military training was partially as a, what's called an independent duty corpsman. That's the person that takes care of the wounded in the field to get them to the hospital, to the NASH or mobile uh, hospitals. Uh, the, in, the Army taught me a great deal on, on how to take care of people. And when I came back, I used my GI Bill to become a physician assistant, which I practiced outside the United States for a while. Well, uh, in Australia, in a place called Papua New Guinea, it's an island above Australia, and Haiti, which is down in off the Florida coast. It, the, the funny thing was that each time I went to one of these places overseas and there'd be a wrecked vehicle or there'd be something that needed to repair, I always ended up being the guy that said, yeah, I can fix this up for you. I can, you know, weld it or, or paint it. And in fact, when I was in the military, I walked into our compound and there were five Jeeps and only one would run. And there were four other ones sitting there absolutely derelict. No one could get them to start. They couldn't run. And I went to my commanding officer. I said, those four Jeeps out there, if I take this, whatever one you pick, okay, pick the worst one and I'll take the parts off of it and get the other three running as long as I can have that last one when we're done. And he said, you know, with a chuckle, sure. You know, he figured I'd never get it going. So I got the other three Jeeps going, and then this last one, I would scrounge parts and put it together. And I was a sergeant, and I had my own Jeep because I had put it together. So it seemed like every place I went, this career followed me. Um, I didn't realize it at first, but I was pretty gifted at painting. Okay, And I've done all of the areas of it, and I like all the areas of it, but painting seemed to be the one that uh, followed me the closest. When I came out of the service, I uh, practiced as a physician assistant for a while. I lived in oh, a whole bunch of different places, down in Nashville, Tennessee, and in other areas where I did rural medicine, but always came back to collision repair, always liked it, and decided to go back and get an associate's degree in collision repair. Then I went on and got my bachelor's degree and started teaching at a vocational school, very similar to this. Uh, I taught at uh, Adrian Botech for 12 and a half years and then um, got recruited to come to Penn College 17 years ago now that I've been at Penn College. While I've been at Penn College, we um, started a new, we, the program that was there before was a very <clears throat> limited old school body shop, um, rust repair uh, mostly. We turned it into a collision repair program, it had, a new building got put up. Um, and now we have not only collision repair, but we have restoration. About two-thirds are in collision repair and about one-third in restoration. We do uh, museum quality restorations. We have probably 20 cars in there from uh, the Wolf uh, Wagon, which is a prototype uh, car, all the way up to a couple of Rolls Royces and, and other really nice uh, vehicles in there. A couple of muscle cars um, that we're doing for, for uh, mostly museums and uh, high-end collectors primarily. And the reason they're high-end collectors is because people with large collections of cars are usually people with means. Okay? And that's uh, about, I guess, five years ago, I was approached by the publishing company of this book and they asked me if uh, there was a proposal that was sent to them by a person out in Kansas, but the person out in Kansas didn't want to write the book. And they came to me, and I had been reviewing books for them for some years, and they asked me if I wanted to do it. And it's a pretty large undertaking. If you look at it, it's 1,100 and some pages, if I remember correctly. And I didn't uh, think I could do it in the time frame that they wanted uh, by myself. And I had a friend out in, in Missouri, this, uh, Mike Jung, that helped me, and, and it took us two years to, to write it and put it together. Um, the book was out, the old edition is back here, and the book was out for about three years, I think it was, and then we went ahead with a second edition, and we added what are called collision-related auto mechanics. We put in electrical electronics, we put in air conditioning, brakes, etc. Um, of those, I recruited a couple of people. Chris Van Stavern did the electronics, electrical. He did a real good job. Mr. Pruden did the uh, uh, steering and suspension and air conditioning, and I did the rest of it. Um, like I said, 15 years here. 15 years as a technician, where I started as entry level, right out of school, all the way up to a manager. After that, I went to teaching in Votech for about 12 and a half years, and now 17 years here. So that's uh, 
basic career. And I'll tell you a sort of a funny story. When I was in high school, there was this really popular kid. You know, I, I wasn't that popular guy. You know, I hung out with the, you know, the, you know, motorheads. <clears throat> and this really one of the really popular guys. He was a musician, played in a local band. And he came up to me and he asked me if I'd paint his car. And at the time, you know, I said, pay for materials, give me a hundred bucks, and I'll paint your car. So I paid for the materials up front because I wouldn't start a person's car until I had it. I didn't want to go in debt paint somebody else's. But I let him slide on the money for, for just paying me for paint. He came and picked up his car, says, I, my man's playing a gig, I'll give it to you in a little while. And uh, it ended up being uh, uh, a local musician in town that you uh, may have heard of, Bob Seeger. I went to school with Bob Seeger and, and Iggy Pop. You know much about Iggy Pop? Iggy Pop was as crazy back then as he is now. Actually, he's less crazy now than he was back then. So, you know, there's uh, uh, ways of learning your skill. You can't become a painter until you pull the trigger, okay? The more you pull the trigger, the better painter you become. I once told a friend of mine, I pinstripe a little bit as a hobby, and I once told a friend of mine who is a really good pinstriper, I said, hey, Ray, I've been practicing my pinstripe. He said, they're all practice. You get better each time you do it. Okay? If you're, you know, if you watch what you do and you analyze at the end, this happened. But first of all, you should know, 50 years of painting, I've never seen a perfect paint job. I've seen some real close to perfect, but there's no such thing as perfect. I mean, there's always a little flaw someplace. It's too bad, but there's always a little flaw. So each time you have something that you want to improve on, you sort of think through what you did and what you can improve. And the thing about painting, to me, is that there's so many variables that you can't that that you can't control. You should control the ones you can. I can't control the weather, okay, but I can control the viscosity of the paint and how I put it on and things of that nature. And if you're um, good at, at analyzing your own stuff, I'm, I'm not talking about beating yourself up. I mean, you know, you run a paint job. Well, that's too bad, but you know that happens. In fact, if somebody comes to me and says I'm a painter and I've never run a paint job, eh, they're probably lying, or they've never painted. Because it happens. You just plan ahead how you're going to you know, make it better the next time. Uh, in fact, it's my opinion that the difference between a good painter and a great painter is the great painter knows how to take care of the mistakes that happen. The mistakes may not be the right thing, but things that happen because of it's a pretty exacting. And are you guys spraying water now? We're set up for him. Waterborne prep is a little bit more difficult than solvent prep. The film thickness of your base coat is half of that of what you're used to. So anything that we used to bury in, in two mils or a mil and a half of a base coat, you can't bury it anymore. So 800 or 1,000 is what you can have. So what did you guys get into the collision repair industry for? Why? Why are you, why are you here? Why are you here? What's your name, by the way? Cody Smith. Cody. I'm Al Cody. Pleased to meet you. <coughs> What, what, what brought you here? Uh -huh. Don't tell me a pickup. <laughs> <laughs> Love of cars. Yeah. yeah. That brings a lot of us to it. You know, I'm, I'm that kid that would sit on the sidewalk and listen to a car with my eyes closed and my friends and try to identify what kind of car it was, you know. And back, you know, you know we're talking 1960s. And in the 1960s, when each car was completely different, you know, you could pick out Oh, that's not a Camaro, that's a Mustang, you know, you could really tell the difference. I do know that I had a little bit of difficulty with the sound of a Harley Davidson and the sound of a Volkswagen. Sometimes they sound different, but, you know, but I, was, I was that person, you know. Um, too many cars, not enough time. Some people say too many girls, not enough time. For me, too, I mean, I've been happily married for 40 years, so in fact, I bought a new car yesterday. You know that nice smell, you know, it's an F-150 pickup that's really nice, but boy, it's too much. Hi, what are you, who are you? I'm Clark Wagner. Hi Clark, how are you? Good. What brought you here? Um, I started working on a 66 Chevy pickup, okay. and I love doing it, so I figured I might want to make a career out of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me speak a little bit about the career. As a collision repair technician, I've sent two kids through college. I have a reasonably nice home. I have a reasonably nice second home in Michigan. Both of them paid for. Um, I 
they're, they're men with more toys than me, but not a lot, okay? I've had a good marriage, and I've had good children, all of which may have been made easier because my income has been reasonable. Now, don't get me wrong, you're not going to become rich. If you want to become rich, then you need a politician or a lawyer or something like that. But there's a lot of work to that, a lot of different kind of stresses to that. It's really been a good career for me. It's kept me in, in the two things that I've liked about being a teacher as it keeps me with young people like you, and when I retire, I'm not going to remiss the politics of the school, I'm not going to miss the drive-in, I'm not going to miss a lot of things, I'm going to miss my students. You know, I've met some of the finest young men over the last 35 years that exist in this country. You know, some people, old guys like me, I'm 65, some geezers will say, eh, the younger generation, they're no good, you've heard this, right? That's not right. That's not right. You know, this younger generation, sure, there's less than favorable people, but there were in mine, and there were in my dad's, and there were in my granddad's. You know, I think we're raising some really good people. So, you know, you're our next leaders, and I think the country's in good hands, by the way. So you'll like the career. I know you will. Cody, right? Clark. Clark. Cody. I mean, Cody Clark. Two C's. C, C, right? Yep. And you are Tyler Wagner. Tyler Wagner. All right? Tyler, what, how, what brought you here? Passion for cars. I like to see some I guess, from poor condition to nice quality vehicle. Yeah, yeah I, I like used to like it when people would tell me, "Oh, that's total. It can't be fixed." You know, no such thing as it can't be fixed. There's a lot of things out there that it's more work to fix it, more cost to fix it than they're worth. And I've tackled a few of those, but there's no such thing as and and when you get that, you know, completely crumpled up car and you straighten it out and you put it together and you put a nice paint job on it and uh, you know I delivered a car the other day and the guy says well I can't tell where you painted and I said that's the idea you know he said where did you and I said oh, we fixed your car be happy no I didn't but you know that when they can't that's our job we want to have a undetectable paint job or an undetectable repair some people make it better. and I've been able to you know I'm middle class kind of person but I own Porsches I own Mercedes, I own, you know, you name it. You know, you're, gonna, you're probably going to ask me what my favorite car is. Okay? You're probably you're at it. See that Cuda back there? My humble opinion, maybe not that color, but uh, 1970 Cuda, wasn't that a Cuda or is that a Charger? That's a Cuda. It's a 1970 one. Cuda with Plump Crazy and a shaker hood on it and a, and a, a 426. Okay, they, when I was in high school, your age, for 2,500 American dollars, you could go down. Now, it wasn't a CUDA then, it was, a, it was Plymouth Sport Fury. Okay? In fact, it was a Plymouth Sport Fury 2. You could buy 426 dual quads from the factory, uh, automatic transmission, that would turn 12 seconds and a quarter mile. That was cool. I was, I was ra raised in a very good time of, you know, I was raised outside Detroit during the muscle car here, and, and Motown was in, still in Detroit. Lots of good music, fast cars. That's all why Italian that. is my favorite too. I, that's why I drove to school, 70 Bear Oh, 70 Coot is a car. I mean, Crown Crazy is not the only color. They yeah, made a forest green real, that was really nice yeah, too. Yeah, my, mine was, I think it was called Hemi Orange. Hemi really Orange, orange. yep, that's one of those Bright six orange. colors. Hemi Orange, Plum Crazy, there was a green that they called something, you know, sort of that lime green that lime, was really yeah. nice. That, or, and, and they're really nice colors that they had for one. And you are, sir? I'm John Lloyd. John Lloyd. Boy, we've had some Lloyds. You had people at Penn College? Okay, John. Maybe it's a family, big family around here? No, we're actually from Maryland. Okay, well, maybe it's like, you know, my last name is Thomas, and there's more Thomases than, you know. What brought you to the. I just love working with cars, maybe something with some junk, but something was nice. Yep. Yep, that uh, 54 Pontiac, my first car I bought for five bucks. Uh, we redid the interior and we see this star right here. I learned that a pressure plate is heavy, you know, when I hear you did the transmission. And my father was not a very good mechanic. He was a farmer. I was raised on a dairy farm. And uh, one day I came home from school and my father's underneath this baler and he's 
pretty angry. You could hear him cussing. My, my father was a very good cusser. He could put cuss words together like a sailor. And you could hear him cursing this piece of machinery out. And I'm walking up. And the more he, I could hear him, the slower I walked, because I knew he was really mad. And I said, what's wrong, Dad? And he says, I sheared every one of the shear pins. If you know anything about a baler, it's got three shear pins on it, because they've got all these plungers and augers and things in there. And if they're not timed right, they hit each other. So these things, if they if they hit, instead of breaking the part, the shear pin shears and the drag, and the power is cut off. Well, he had been working all day on it and couldn't get it done. It was time to milk the cows. And I said, do you mind if I mess with it for a while? He sort of snorted and said, no, no, you couldn't be here. I've been working on it, you know, and walked away. And about 30 minutes later, I walked to the barn and he was milking and he said, I see you couldn't get it done either. I said, well, no, I timed it. And the last round and it's sitting outside the barn and he got real quiet you don't want to be around my dad he's real quiet at the end of the thing he came up to me he says come with me and he walked me over to the shed and he showed me that he had this really nice craftsman tool set he says these are yours now because you can use them better than I can and from that point on about 14 years old I knew that I had a propensity for doing these kinds of things it came naturally to me and uh, it's nice when you feel successful doing something. And we can relate it that I started out by saying I, I'm a bad speller and I don't like English, you know. And it's probably because I wasn't very successful at that, okay. And I was successful at auto body painting mechanical things. Just like when my son was being, he was young, he was 17, he was a really good musician. I bought him his first guitar when he was 14 and he just really took to it. And I uh, would have liked to him to go on and you know get his masters and all this other stuff, but he became a professional musician, and um, it really chose him. And that's what he does for a living now. If you if you go on on um, iTunes to buy a tune and you want to see what the review is of it and the people singing it, and my son is, works for the company that writes all of those things, so he writes while he's on tour with his band. If you're into indie music, his thing is. Uh, Saturday looks good to me. It's on part of my own records. Not that I'm <laughs> pushing these records, but if you're in, in so. and you are, sir. Um, Thirty-nine. Another Cody. Yeah. Cody Masters. Madison. 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 Like Madison. Like. Madison. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I'm not hearing well. I, I have a little bit of a hearing loss, and I apologize. By the way, protect your ears and body work. You know. It'll, and it's, it's insidious. It, it creeps up on you and you don't realize it. If you're out there in the shop working and your buddy had, you have to raise your voice to talk to your buddy, you probably need earplugs in. Or you'll end up like me. With, uh, and this is, this is a career that's not easy on your body. You know, I can sit here and show you that I've had to have both thumb joints replaced. You know, had to have the hip replaced. Didn't think I could pinstripe again when they replaced this one. but. You know, I, through practice, I was able to pull a good, good line again. So, so and and what's what's your interest? What started you? Uh, I just like working with cars, and I, that's all my dad did. And I was mm -hmm. always around watching him. Yep. And I loved going to car shows and looking at cars and seeing they have pictures like what it looked like before and after. Yeah, that stuff. Really cool. Ty's back there taking pictures. He's going to show you some pictures of this Buick that we're taking. And that's going to be good for your portfolio when you go off to you know get a job. You know, there's uh, um, um, plenty of people who claim that they can do certain, but not many people do it well. So keep track of what you're doing. And and it's nice that you and your dad do things together. Probably two of the most pleasant things I did with my children. Okay, both of my children we built a car together, and both of my children we took a cross country motorcycle trip. You know, when they turned 16, I, we got on a motorcycle. My son and I, we went to San Francisco and then down to Los Angeles and then home. And when my daughter turned 16, we went to Sturgis Motorcycle Rally and then over to Yellowstone and Grand Canyon and down to Route 66 or Route 66. So my wife went with us. She, when, when I took my daughter, she says, I'm not going to turn 16 again. When do I get to go along? So my daughter and I spent a whole winter painting other people's motorcycles. Bought a sidecar and put it on, so it was my wife, my daughter, and myself. Motorcycle with a sidecar and a trailer behind it. And we had a wonderful time going across the United States. Sort of, you know, I don't think you guys ride motorcycles, and I'm 
they're dangerous, don't get me wrong, I have to show you scars, you know, because your moms are all, will hate me when they see that. So always tell them to ride motorcycles. If you ride motorcycles, just like if you drive a car or any of those things, be safe. Take care of yourself, okay? Because you can, you can end up with, with scars. But that's fun, to, you know, the smells and all that. And you are, sir. Rafael, nice to see you. Not, not another, not, okay. What was the last name again? Rivera. Rivera, all right. How, what brought you here? Well, I like to work with cars and I like painting. You like painting? Yeah. I have, uh, I have, uh, I've taught a class. I, I haven't taught it for a while. I'm teaching again next semester called Autographics, where we teach people how to do flames and other uh, customs. And in one section, we compare custom painting. Every culture, every culture has a custom painting style. If you look at the Philippines, it's very Muslim oriented. They have a lot of icons of uh, Mary and other things. If you look at the East Coast, there's another style. If you look at the West Coast, there's another style. There's a style that came out of Los Angeles that, for lack of a better word, is called the Barrio style. And there's lots of gorgeous cars out there that you should look at all the different styles. Because what really looks good is when you sort of mix everybody's ideas. There, there's a theory that says there was only one original idea in the world and everything else is an improvement on that, you know, like um, um, a good artist borrows and a great artist steals. So, you know, look at everybody else's stuff. That's what helps you to inspire what you're doing. I assume we're talking about custom cars and some nice paint jobs and things like that, which I'm certainly into. I've nothing, um, probably one of the most rewarding cars I ever did was a 63 Chevrolet that was just sweet 60 Impala. You know, nice car, nice car. In fact, I also like the old school 1950s Chevys too, which was real nice. So nice meeting you, Raphael, right? And your friend behind you. I'm Hector Chariots. Did you say Hector? Yes. Okay, and the last name was? Chariots. Chariot, like a, like a Roman chariot. Yeah. So is it spelled the same way? No. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I've got to put these in my mind or I won't remember you guys. And I probably won't always remember your names and I apologize for that. I can give you a, a reason why, but it's a long story. I don't, you know, it's about my part of my Vietnam experience. We didn't learn people's names because if they died, we wouldn't have to grieve for them. You know, so we uh, just, and then, since then, I've never had to, I've never been able to remember them. Sorry about that. What brought you into this? Um, honestly, I kind of got started with uh, the games. With the game? Yeah. Don't tell me uh, Grand Theft Auto. No. No, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it was Midnight Club. Okay. So, like, the, the customization of the cars. Uh, got me into it. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I I uh, have a, a a pickup at home. You know what a Ford uh, uh, Splash is? It's a Ranger, but it's all fiberglass. And I have a chopped. Uh, it's lowered four inches, uh, six inch in front, four inches in the back. It's chopped six inches out of the roof. It's, it's channeled four inches in the body. So you know we're talking this far off the ground. It's uh, now it's got a the old four cylinder in it, but I'm putting a 5.0 in it, you know, I'm sort of a 5.0 fan. 5.0s you can buy out of old Lincoln Town cars real cheap and then swap them in the, into your hot rod real easy. I'm also making a uh, 1932 Ford wrap rod, but where my goal was to make it uh, for less than $12,000, so I made the frame myself and I am hand hammering the body to hold my cars. That's, you know, at my point in the career, I really like using the English wheel and you know, getting these things just right, and then you stand back. I went to a car show once with my daughter when she was only about this big. Of course, I tease her. She's 32 and she's only this big now, but she's five foot and one half inch. In fact, this pickup that I got, she wants to borrow it to pull our, we have a camper trailer we share, so I got those new <laughs> pedals that move, you know, so she can bring the pedals up and not have to be this close to the steering wheel. But I don't tease her about that too much because she's a little sensitive. But um, I went to a car show once, and the three top winning cars I had painted. And that's sort of nice to be able to poke your kids and say, hey, 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 h
Well, Grand Funk Railroad was a little bit after. That's Mark Farner and some people out of uh, Flint, Michigan. But uh, the Funk Brothers, if you listen to any Motown of the 1960s, um, Barry Gordy and stuff like that, their backup band, the band that did all the playing was the Funk Brothers. There's a thing called Standing in the Shadow of Motown. It's an excellent documentary if you get a chance to see. Excuse me, I'm sort of into music. So what did what did you what brought you here? Well, I just like being able to see something that's what some people call junk and then getting it and turning it into something that's not junk. Yep, I know what you're saying. You know, it, it my my wife used to find it odd because I, in the winter time I'd buy a, a fifty dollar you know back then it was fifty dollar it would be a thousand dollar beater you know oh it's just a beater I'm going to drive it for the winter time. And then I would drive it through the winter. And then the next summer when I'm driving my nice cars, I'm working on this beater. By the time the next winter comes along, the beater's no longer a winter beater, you know. It's something really nice and I have to look for another beater, you know. That's how I got that 125 cars. Cause I'm, and the nice thing is that you get to drive all of them for a while, you know. I've had a Porsche, I've had, you know, all of these different things. And found out that some of them, you know, I, I would rather have one Cuda for two Porsches, you know, and but I didn't know that till I owned them. I like sort of going straight that I mean the Porsche handled like it was on rails. But that's not me, you know. But it was fun to have for a while. It was red of course, which made it made it real nice. I was already married so it couldn't be a chick magnet. <laughs> Cars can be. Okay. Yes sir. Uh Barth Heimbach. Barth? Yeah, yeah Barth. And the last name? Heimbach. Heimbach with an H. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of Steinbachs that live in my area. I didn't, I wanted to make sure I was straight away. Right. And you said the first name again? Uh, Barth. Barth, T-H. Yeah. yeah. Barth, what's up? What's happening? How did you get to this? Um, I started the store in my 71 Beaumont Sport Coupe, and I realized that I really like doing this. Yep, yep. I think that buying a vehicle with my children and working together was one of the most I mean, I'm not a baseball player. I couldn't teach them how to play basketball. I'm not in this sports. So I'm an okay hunter, but there are people better than me. I'm not the best fisherman out there. And, but um, it was really a lot of fun that taking these cars completely apart. I mean, we completely stripped and rotisserie. I mean, the whole nine yards. And it helped me really bond with my, with my kids. You know, neither one of them are in this industry, but both of them are you know, sort of car nuts like me. It's a lot of fun. You know, you can, if, if, you, if you have a career that you love, you don't have a job. You know, you get to go and do the stuff you like. It's not a, oh my God, I'm going to work eight hours. I mean, I have Facebook friends that say, oh, it's noon, I've got four more hours. I, mean, I don't know how people live through that kind of stuff. You know, I like to do what I do. So, yeah, that's, it's fun to be able to do it. Now, let me tell you another story about my children versus you guys. My daughter is a physician assistant. She makes very, very good money. And she's 34 years old, just bought a half a million dollar house. So she's got to be making good money. But she will never own the hospital. If you look at the statistics, about 60% of the people of you that go into collision repair professionally, about 60% of you will end up either being the manager of a shop for someone else or own your own business. Okay. And that's um, pretty productive. I mean, I'm, I'm, you don't see a lot of 65-year-old men still on the floor. I still do the work on the floor. In fact, I felt a little bad because I was so dusty when I got here. You know, I get right in and work with the kids. You know, I, I'm not a stand-back kind of person. But um, um, most of the people that once you get into your 40s or 50s, you start being a manager, and, and, and you're still in it, but you can have a fairly... I don't know if you wanted to use the word lucrative. There are more you can make more money in other jobs, but it's a very satisfying the money that you can make, and it's comfortable living. So you guys could all end up with your own business, and that's pretty pretty nice. In fact, I just read something out of Wall Street Journal that a class from Harvard University or is Harvard or Yale, I don't remember, just sued the company, sued Harvard for false advertisement because they told them what great jobs they would get when they graduate, they're all lawyers, and they went out there and couldn't find the jobs that they thought they should have, you know, these great high dollar jobs, and they thought they could sue Harvard, and uh, the Supreme Court says they couldn't. 
but uh, there's so many lawyers out there that those high paying jobs aren't as uh, predominant as they used to be. And I got to tell you, although there's fewer body shops, there become there used to be a whole bunch of really small ones. Now there's less, but they're larger. There's still we're still wrecking as many cars as we always did. And when you have a car that's worth forty thousand dollars, okay, I just bought a pickup. You pay forty thousand dollars for a good pickup. If you total that at seventy five percent, you know what seventy five percent of ten would be seven fourteen. Uh, $28,000, that you could have a $28,000 repair bill on that pickup that's sitting out in front and still have the insurance company pay you. Okay, that's a lot of money. Even if it took you three weeks to get it done, which I doubt it would take you that long as long as you had the parts. Parts are always the downfall. But if you got it done and you're making a, a good, you know, hourly rate, man, that's a, you know, a pretty, uh, what's the right word? Comfortable that you can have that kind of what job stability. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle Dunkel. Kyle, it was. Yeah. And Dunkel. Yeah. Hi, hi, Kyle. And my wife likes cars. And I liked them from an early age. I, you know, it's sort of, you, you know, when I look back at it. Um, my father put me on a tractor driving it when I was very young. In fact, I was so young that, can you guys know what a Ford 9N tractor is? And yeah, probably too young for that. But it does have a, had a the, the part of the engine here, two brakes on one side, and the, and the clutch over here, and a big steering wheel. I was so young that I had to put both feet on the steering on the clutch and pull up on the steering wheel to push the clutch down. You know, seven or eight years old, and my dad taught me how to drive. So I've sort of had the curse of, Detroit, as my daughter likes to call it, you know, car curse ever since. It's, it's been a good curse, although at some time point my mother thought it was a ill-gotten youth, you know, but I proved her wrong. I had an English well, I shouldn't take this on my tape. I got caught reading a, a Hot Rod Mike magazine in school once, and you shouldn't do that. Okay? But the teacher says, I suppose you're going to find a job that pay you to read Hot Rod magazine. It did take me 20 years, but I found that job. It you know, pays me to read Hot Rod magazine. Hey, it's research, isn't it? It's research. Yes, sir. Oh, my name is Enrique. Enrique? Uh, Sada? Estrada. Estrada, excuse me. I'm having two problems. One, you making my ear here, and two, making my tongue say Estrada right. <laughs> I don't, I can't, I can't do the nice Spanish, you know, that uh, warble that the good Spanish has. I've not been able to do that, so excuse me. Okay. Um, that's just like cars and colors, and I like, if you get a chance to look at uh, two brothers in history called the Barris Brothers, okay, Barris Brothers are Californian. They started this custom with a K, a body shop in the 1950s, and they're the guys that did a lot of movie car stuff. Uh, the, the Munster family cars and things like this, but they're they're famous for what they call lead sleds, and uh, the reason they call them lead sleds is they didn't use binder back then; they used lead. And they were very uh, well known for taking a Buick bumper and putting it on an Oldsmobile and, and frenching in headlights and you know doing all these things. And we don't see as much of that anymore, but there's still a lot of really nice rides that can be made. Like you can take a kind of a uh, a Lincoln SUV and put the whole front end clip on a 150 pickup. So you've got this front Lincoln front end. Uh, of course, Lincoln made pickups for a very short period of time, but there's not many of them around. And you can mix and match these things and make them look really sweet. You know, you can end up with something. I, I've I've always been I've always driven a car that made people turn around and look at it. And that that's cool. But I'm not talking about parade. I mean just going down the road and somebody's you know. And uh, that always makes me feel that makes me feel that my craft is well well honed. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's a, a, a good and and it's not the most academic thing, but man, it can sure make you feel comfortable. You know, it sure make you feel satisfied at the end of the day. There's there's a biblical term that says the rest of a of a laboring man is so sweet. In other words, the person who's worked hard all day they go home and they sleep well. It's sort of nice to go home and be satisfied with what you do and feel
feel accomplished with what you do and it makes your everything nicer, you know. Your relationship with your family or your dog or whomever, you know, just much nicer. And best for last, right? I thought so. And you are? Calvin uh, uh, Calvin? Yeah. Uh, and last name, please? Delvaux. I didn't hear it. Delvaux. Delvaux? Yeah. All right. Very good. Sorry, I, I probably slaughtered that a little bit. Yep. And actually, he, he brought up a, a, a really, you know, there are, say you don't become a, an overall body person that does everything, okay? There's a lot of things in the body shop world that you can do um, that are still fun and a lot and can make good money. Detailing is one of them. I have a friend of mine who runs a detail shop in California. He's got a van and he goes around to all these places detailing out of his van and makes a very good living. I have another friend of mine that does PDR. Are you familiar with painless step repair? repair? This guy, not, he's not a storm chaser. There are some people that are storm chasers, but he's a guy that has, he goes to juice car lots, he goes to body shops, he has a circuit that he goes through, and he does painless dent repair. And he doesn't, doesn't seem like he charges a lot. $20 for this dent, and $30 for this one, and he does, he'll have used car dealerships that may have four or five cars waiting for him every Monday or Tuesday, whatever his day is to get there. And I, I shattered him one day because I write articles for Auto Body Repair News. It's a journal, I don't know. You get it? Yeah, we got I, I, I'm one of the writers for him, and I shattered him. And he showed me what he did and all this, and all day he's telling me you know, all these things, and I started taking notes about how much he made. This guy's making $200,000 a year. Doesn't sound like a lot because it's only $20 here and $40 here, but you do $40 20 times in one day. You know, it adds up. And he had no overhead. I mean, the building he did his work in was somebody else's. All he had was a, a beat-up old Datsun pickup with all his tools in the back. And he'd pull in in the middle of winter, and they'd heat the, you know, it was their building, their heat, their insurance. I mean, it was a pretty nice thing. I know another guy that, that has a business, and all he does is change filters in the booth. You go into all these body shops and change filters, rebuild uh, paint guns, all these other things, and it's a good lucrative business. So there's lots of avenues you could do. Paint manufacturers love to have painters that can, um, can uh, sell their product and help out. I have a very good friend of mine who works for PPG, Todd Warren, and he uh, had, was a painter uh, as a child, young man, second generation body man. His dad was a body man, and now he sells for PPG. And has a very good so it's not just banging on cars. You know, it could be an estimator, it could be an insurance person, it could be a lot. Of, it could even be a teacher. I know nobody in here would like to do that, but it could even be a teacher. I'm teaching because they're fun So if I missed anything, I talked a lot. I hope I've been helpful to you. Is there something that you that you know you're dying to know that I didn't talk about? Tyler, you had a question about painting. About what? Pin striking. Pin striking? Yeah. Okay. Shoot. Sure. You see, like, at all these car shows and classic car shows and stuff, the pin striking that they do on the cars by hand, yep. they never, like, do a clear coat or anything over it. Is there a reason for that? They pay good money for the pin striping and they don't protect it. Yep. What's the reason? I, I, will, I will answer that for you. There, there are, up until about, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, nobody cleared over pinstriping. The only kind of pinstriping paint that, not the only one out there, the one that was used was called One Shot. And One Shot is technically old uh, air dry enamel. In fact, you use mineral spirits to, I mean, we're talking old technology, 1940s. And you can't put clear coat over top of it, it'll wrinkle. Okay? They found out that you could mix the hardener of the clear. Say I wanted to put PPG clear over top of it, and the hardener that I was going to put in the clear, I could put in the pin strike, mix it up, put it on, put my clear over top of it, and it'd be all right. But the pin strike didn't pull, you know, the way that they were used to. Most pin stripers are freehand pin strikers, you know. Oh, some famous ones. Uh, oh, I'm, the names are not going to come to me. The guy that does the flying eyeball. Uh, but there's a lot of them out there that are all freehand. And they just didn't. But 
One shot lasted a good long time. Lately, say when I say lately, in the last 10 years, we're now, if you took my autographic splash, you'd clear over top of them. You'd take your paint, you, and it would be one shot. We'd harden it. We'd uh, go ahead and put clear over top of it. Then we'd sand the clear, because pinstriping sticks up above. It takes a lot of clear to bury it. And as your teacher, I'm sure, has told you, once you get past 12 or 15 thousandths of an inch, you can run into cracking and other kinds of problems because of film thickness. And that's another reason a lot of clear was not put on. What I normally do is put a line on, two coats of clear, sand the clear, which sands off most of it, put another two coats of clear until I, until I can't feel it at all. And that's the way I like to see it done. But your observation is correct. Most of the cars that you see these pinstripes on are not going to be cars that you drive to the grocery store and have out in the sun all day long. They're going to be garage kept, well-maintained, waxed uh, kinds of cars. Um, and it usually holds up pretty well. But I hope that answers your question. Pinstriping is a fun uh, hobby to have. You know, uh, if you, and it takes a lot of practice to be good at it. I do it, and I'm only marginally good. I'm good enough for the you know, stuff that I do. Um, I could probably sell my work, but I would not do it professionally because there's too many other people out there. That are. I've got a friend of mine that's Ray uh, that I told you about that can pinstripe and have this beautiful flying falcon or whatever in minutes, and you just I, you're in awe of the pinstripe, and you're in awe at how quickly he did it. I'm envious of those kind of people. But I'm envious of good guitar players, and I'm envious of good artists. I mean, there's stuff out there that are just, you know, good basketball players. You know, these, you know, and I'm not a basketball fan, but you know, these quarterbacks that, I mean, all that kind of skill is just, and the only way you get those kinds of skill, I don't care how you cut it, is practice, practice, practice. Same way with painting. You know, like I started out by saying that the, Way to become a good painter is go trigger. Anything else? Did that help? Anything else? Oh, don't be shy. I haven't bitten anybody in a couple of weeks. Yes, sir. Did you ever work on any Novas? Novas, I sure have. Well, Chevy 2 became Nova, okay? And I worked on the last year of a Chevy 2. It was the first year you could get a 327 in it. Pretty cool. You know, 327 and a little Nova. Uh, we're talking a uh, horsepower to weight ratio was just out of the world. I had a Chevy Nova 327. Um, it was a Corvette. Back then, the, the best four speed transmission were made for Corvettes. They were a narrow shift pattern. It had a narrow shift pattern, and it went back to a 411 gear. 411 gear on the streets, pretty low. Okay. So it didn't go very fast top end, but we get there real quick. And it was two-tone seafoam green and uh, turquoise, which was pretty neat. And it had a nice pinstripe down the side. And the pinstripe was, believe it or not, pink. And I know that sounds girly, but it looks good with those two other colors. You know, you'd be surprised the colors you choose for pinstriping. I mean, I often will put a lavender or a pink or a purple on there. And it doesn't sound, you know, when you talk about it, but when you see it on the car, it, it fits really good. You have a colored wheel in here. You have a colored wheel. Reg, Reggie Bibbs, okay? These colored wheels are pretty neat, okay? You, this, is, this is a colored wheel, and the, the, you can go, if you're mixing paint, that's what this is. This is a tinting chart. You can mix this way, and you can mix this way. You can't mix this way. You know, this color is never going to be yellow. It's going to be over here in violet. It's going to be over here in aqua. Okay? So, <laughs> when I put a pinstripe color, and it's this color, I sometimes, this, this would be contrast, and this would be, this would be complementary. So, if I want to complement, I'm going to go here or here. If I want to contrast, I'm going to go over here. So, I may have a color up here with a pinstripe over here. The pinstripe's real narrow, and, it, and it's contrast, but it's going to help the paint job because it's so, so small. If you ever have to get dressed up to go to church with mom and you've got a blue shirt, you can wear a tie either on this side of the color spectrum or on this side of the color spectrum. Don't wear a yellow tie with a blue shirt. I'm serious. I mean, I'm not good at this kind of stuff. My wife's good. You know, girls are really into this stuff. They match everything. 
they spend a lot of time doing it. I don't want to spend that much time, so I've got a color wheel in my and oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna blue shirt on. Well, I can wear you know. Maybe I've got maybe you don't get dressed up for church as often as I I should. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Have you ever had to um, form a panel for a panel for rare? For for I for like a rare part. We we have in our restoration uh, program, we have five English wheels, we have a Uber machine, we have uh, uh, all these tables. And uh, to be honest, you're asking me personally, I'm not as good with steel as other people are, but I'm real good with fiberglass. I'll make a mold out of it and I'll pull the mold. You can make the mold out of foam and you can sand the foam and you can get it just exactly the way you want it. Then you can make a negative. Okay, and then turn it upside down and you make the part out of it. And the nice thing about it is that once that mold's made, you can make a Brazilian parts. That's a lot, by the way. Okay, that's a whole lot more than a million. So I, I'm more into fiberglass, and I'm lucky I don't itch. Some people itch with fiberglass, I don't, and that's a real luck. Yes, sir? Do you, do you actually like making like, body kits and stuff for cars? Uh, I would rather make a body kit and, and put it on, then buy a body kit and put it on. Because the body, body, body kits that I purchased, there's only been one or two companies that the body kits, you don't have to wrestle them to put them on, you know. Uh, fiberglass, when it comes out of a mold, is, is not 100% cured. And sometimes if you pull it out of the mold and you have to twist it, it ends up being twisted when it dries. And then when you put it on the car, it's, that's why I like composite a little better. Composite actually goes in a form, heats up, boom, it's there. Um, there, and there are companies out there that do a good job. I bought a, a Ranger hood that went on and was just perfect. And I'm trying to remember the name of the company it's out of New Jersey. It was a little bit more expensive, but it was really worthwhile. But personally, I like one-offs. And to get a one-off, I, I make my own mold and, and do it. And by the way, we teach that at college too. We have a, a mold-making class, a composite class. You know, there's the, the, when you get ready to build your own car, you're only limited by your imagination. And if you don't know how to do something, read about it, find somebody. I mean, YouTube. You know, my wife's got a, my wife has a, a Mercedes, okay, a nice car. You know, it's got the turn signal in the in the uh, 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 mirror. But I didn't know how to take the mirror part off, you know, because there's a special thing I found out later that you lift the mirror up, get into a screwdriver, pop a clip, and the whole mirror case comes off, and you can change this. Hundred dollar three balls, hundred and fifteen dollars, and put it back on. I didn't know how to do that, but YouTube had it. You know, it's all sorts of stuff on YouTube. So you know, don't be afraid to do the research. You know, and you say research doesn't that take a, you know brain surgeon to do it? Kind of, not brain surgeon. I do it all the time. In fact, I have a smartphone someplace up in my truck probably that I really like because if somebody uses a word or says something and I don't know what it is, man, I'm Googling that thing, you know? Oh, that's what it means, you know? I, I had a class, I teach a class in automotive history, the first 100 years in the United States from 1909 to present day. It's a little bit more than 100 years. And one of the founders in Chrysler Corporation in Hudson Motor Company was a guy by the name of, uh, oh, that's going to slip my mind, not Frigidaire, but uh, Calvinator. And it stuck in my head, Calvinator, Calvinator, I should know that. Now, Calvinator was a refrigerator back in the day. Not, Frigidaire was first, and by the way, that's a General Motors company. And then Calvinator, and the same Calvinator guy that made money off of these air conditioning out of Detroit, uh, was part of the beginning of Hudson Motor Company. It's a car company that doesn't exist any longer. But back in the 50s, it was part of Chrysler Corporation. There's still one Hudson dealership in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Lots of neat cars have come and gone. Any other questions? I like these kinds of questions. Yes, sir. What, you say you have muscle cars up in your shop. Yes. What do you have? We have a, what's the Chevy? We have a Super Sport. Yeah. 70 Chevelle. 70 Chevelle Super yeah. Sport 426. Yeah. 400. 426 Chevrolet, 426. Uh, we had a uh, you may argue on whether an early Mustang is a muscle car. I would say that it is. You know, we have a 289 Mustang convertible. You know, not as not as fast as some of the other ones. 
but right now, those are the only two that we have in there. Uh, but it's a it's a frame off. You know, we're, we have rotisseries, and we're, when it's done, it will be. I would venture to say better than the day it came off of the off of the assembly line because we are able to take more time and do it. You know, cars are assembled at about 60 cars per hour. That means you have one minute to get your job done, and you do that 60 times a hour or eight hours. Okay, do the math. You know, uh, 60 times eight. That's how many cars you work on in a one ship. So you can see how it's. You don't have much time to do. Of course, you don't have to do a lot. You only want to do a few things. But I, I started on the assembly line. I started my, but I came back to, before I went to Vietnam. I, I worked for a Ford Motor Company making Lincolns and Thunderbirds at the Wixom plant. Did you ever see that black Lincoln that's in uh, Matrix? Okay, there's a 50% chance that I built that car. That year of that car, I was working second shift building building Lincoln. So. Any other questions? Yes? What was your favorite car to ever work on? Who got the Arroyo? And by a gentleman by the name of Tom Monahan, scared me to death when he first wanted me to work on it. My wife, Tom Monahan, started Domino's Pizza, and he became very rich because of that, and he put his money into cars. And he was the first man to pay a million dollars for a car. The car was in pretty good shape, but it had a couple of little dings on it, and it was a, a light uh, yellow, a little darker than your walls. And through my wife, who was working for him at the time, she uh, uh, he asked me to fix some things up, polish it, detail it out. Would I do it? And I said, yes, I'd be glad to. But I did it with fear and trembling, because a million dollar car is a million dollar car. You know, if something went wrong, I would feel like I had just but it didn't, and I got to drive it. And, and uh, I, at first, I told my wife, I don't think I would spend a million dollars for a car, and I really like it. Two and a half years later, he sold it for one million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I'm not, I'm not the dummy. I mean, he's not the dummy. I am. You had a question, sir. Um, what would be your your favorite grouping of cars? Grouping of cars? I can say that real easily. That's an easy answer question. 1955, 56, and 57. Every single car company made beautiful cars. 55, 56, and 57. If you don't think you're right, Google it. Okay? Yes, when you think of 5, 6, and 7, you're thinking of Chevrolet. And you're right. That's the big three for Chevrolet. But look at Ford at the time. Even their Etzel, 57 Etzel, piece of junk, but it was a pretty car. Hideaway hardtop, gorgeous car. Buicks, 55 Buick, gorgeous car. Big, big boat, you know, it's not a hot rod, but it's a beautiful car. 55, 56, and 57 was, at the end of the Second World War, a whole bunch of people came back and, became, and had a GI Bill and went off in 1945 and got their degree. So between 1945 and 1948, they're in college. Between 1948 and 1955, the first generation of these Second World War people, and they were fighter pilots and been in planes, and that's when you see the fins come out. 19, in 1959, Cadillac with the two red big fins on the back. Gorgeous car. I mean, absolutely beautiful. And for a few years, we were changing models every single year, and the next one looked prettier than the first one, and they were doing stuff like hiding the, the gas cap behind the turn signals and back. My 55, uh, 56 Chevrolet put gas in it, the right rear yeah, turn uh, brake light and back went to the side and there was a place to put the gas in there. Um, that's when you take the license plate down and put gasoline in the back of it. You had um, um, you, the, the first overhead valve cars, obviously I get excited about these kinds of cars. I think 55, 56, 57 was just I mean, that was really before my time. You know, my, I became of age in, in more about um, probably closer to the 60s. But man, there were gorgeous cars even to then. But if you wanted the, the three years, that would be it. Do you, you uh, think? Oh, definitely. My first car was a 57 Chevy. Yeah. 57, 55, 56, 57. Now, don't get me wrong, a 60 Chevy looks good too. Okay? 59 Chevy. Okay, you don't see many of them out there. They didn't make that body style for a lot. It was a gorgeous car. Um, a 63 Impala, gorgeous car. 
uh, Mustangs, uh, Chevy 2s, Novas, uh, uh, all the super sport you think. Got a little bit bigger car, but you know, uh, uh, and Chrysler had your, your Sport Furies, had your, you know, your Cudas, you had your, even Barracudas. The first car I bought for my wife was a Barracuda. Barracuda with a custom paint job and Krager mags on it, and she couldn't drive worth a darn. So it was a, three, a 383 too, which is a pretty nice motor, okay? She wrecked it a couple times, but she knew about it. But she was 25 years old before she learned how to drive. I thought that was a tragedy. 25 years old and not driving. How can you do such a thing? So I taught her to drive. Obviously not very well. <laughs> but uh, My father always said the same thing. That was such a golden time because it was so exciting when a new model year came out. Because every year is a different body style. Every right? year is a different body style. Yeah, I so it was exciting. They, they cover up the windows in the showrooms. And oh, everything yeah. come up the cars and they would come yeah. in from the from the factories. Yep. Okay. And the I first load of them come in on the trailers and they'd be all covered up and nobody always just grand openings at model change, you know. Uh, my father would trade his car every three years. I mean now you gotta finance the things for six or seven, you gotta own them for ten. Yeah. You know, I mean I like cars. I don't want to keep one car for ten years. I have to financially, but that's not my, I mean, I just assume trade about every 90 days. I don't mean to keep you guys from this. You leave it already? Lewisburg yesterday, yeah. Lewisburg. Well, any other questions? I like that particular question because I had a ready answer for it. Obviously, I've thought about that. I don't have, yeah. I, I am loyal to Fords, okay? But I'm loyal to Fords because I've worked for them and I've been, good to me. There's lots of other cars out there. I mean, I tease my bow tie friends, you know, I say things like, nobody looks good in a bow tie, but that's not true. There's lots of great Chevys, because I want you Chevy guys to know I, you're okay too. You're a Chevy guy. I know you are. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm a blue oval, and you probably have, I mean, I, you wouldn't tattoo a blue oval on your, I wouldn't either. You know, and that's part of the fun. You know, the, the like sports rivalry, car rivalries, you know, it's, and then, you know, it's, I mean, it used to be a guy thing, but it's not. There's a lot of women out there that are just as car crazy as we are. And it's, it's, I can think of a whole lot worse things to be crazy about. Yes, sir? Any imports that you like? Yep, I could tell you that one, too. And it's my wife who influenced me on this one. Uh, Eagle Talon, first generation Eagle Talon. Uh, All-wheel drive, first generation Mitsubishi motor. All-wheel drive, turbo, of course. A little bit better if you dual turbo them, you know. Um, the dual turbos, you get rid of the turbo bag because the first the first generation Eagle Talons, uh, they could be a 12 second car with just a little bit of work. Put a little bit bigger boost on them, let them breathe just a little bit better, but they're pretty good. So I like Eclipses too. I think Eclipse is a pretty nice one. Um, I've had some Hondas and some and some Toyotas, but I'm you know they're not the, they're not the tuner cars. If you, I'm sure that's what you're asking about. Yeah. Tuner car. For me, and just again, that's an opinion, it would be the Eagle Talon. And obviously, you're familiar with it. It's, it's a nice car. It was a nice car. Now, Mitsubishi's have a reputation of running fast, but not long. Okay? Uh, just like big rat motors, they blow up. But if you get a motor that's running that strong, they'll let loose sometimes. And you have to rebuild them. That's just part of the game. See, this is like who's the best guitar player in the world? That's one of those hard questions. But, you know, is it you know, is it Jimi Hendrix? You know, is it Eric Clapton? Is it B.B. King? And everybody has an opinion. So, what's your favorite? Go My favorite would be between a Honda Civic. Oh, okay. Ninety-nine. Okay. And a ninety-eight Nissan Skyline GTR. Yep. Yep. I'm working on the first uh, late model Nissan Z, okay, it's too bad, it's a D-Lam, and then it's a factory D-Lam, and I feel really bad about it, because delamination, peeling, you know, from the, actually, there's a difference between peeling and D-Lam, peeling goes all the way down to the base, you know, D-Lam is between base coat and clear coat, and this is a D-Lam, and it's a factory problem, and it's too bad, because we've got to completely take this car apart, and Nissan's, especially the Z's, 
Everything's nicely put together and tight, and it's not easy to detrim. But yeah, it's a, it's a, a nice car. I don't want to bring my wife in to see it because she'll want to have one. Because she was telling me the other day, I just bought a pickup, so you know what? She's you know she's oh, my next car. <laughs> yep. Yeah, hers is next. So it'll probably she, she I think she's going to ask. She wants an Eclipse uh, convertible. By the way, she's selling her Firebird convertible. You know, I've been looking for a third generation of Firebird black convertible, uh, green, black interior leather, really nice car. Only got 63,000 miles. I think she wants $6,500 worth. Not a bad price for her. And here I am. Here I am selling my car. That's not right. Talking cars. That's, that's all right. But that's part of the, you know, that's the thing. Any other questions, gentlemen? Well, let me say this. I appreciate you letting me come out and talk about what I have spent my whole life doing, you know. And it's obviously, I hope you understand from the way I presented it that it's been fun, okay. It's been a good career. It's been something that I have loved doing. I, I've loved building cars. I liked writing that book. I liked being a teacher. All of these things have been a, a very rewarding. Now, now don't get me wrong, along with all the pleasure, there has been some rough edges and every once in a while I felt like I needed to take a vacation, okay? Uh, but by and large, when you look back, you know, and a guy my age looks back because there's not as much a forward to look at. But uh, it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good. And I think you guys could have a pretty good career. You're at that point where I know you've got a lot of questions, you know, what happens, you know, what's to do next, you know, you know, can I do it? Those questions are natural. Uh, if you didn't have them, I'd worry about you, you know, but, you know, uh, hang in there, it's going to work out, and I think uh, you've chosen, a, in my humble opinion, an excellent career. I'll turn it back over to your man then. Thanks for letting me come out. Oh, thank you. Okay. Very enjoyable. You bet. And Jesse's been a good boy. Thank you.